This is for this talk. Was it out in the provinces? Sometimes we don't always rely so much on data to, conf to do what we do for spinal cord injury. It's often anecdotal. And so I, I've had some cases over the last couple of years of patients who have actually gotten caught in avalanches and been actually in the backcountry for long periods of time who have had bad fracture dislocations who have done remarkably well. And when they come in, they're hypothermic. And the question is, was there any data to support any of this hypothermia or anything like that? And so that was the impetus to go and, and, and look at the data behind this and, and to see if there was anything to hypothermia from a, 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 a evidence-based standpoint. Much of the hype around hypothermia started with this case that was published by uh, Dr. Cappuccino. This was a professional football player who came in Asia A after tackling somebody. He was given chilled saline in the field as well as steroids and had early reduction and uh, surgery. Within about four hours of the, uh, in, uh, the incident, he was taken to the OR and was actually reduced within about six hours. Interestingly, intraoperatively, they noted his temp was down to 34.5, which we'll call modest hypothermia. And by the next morning, he was actually Asia C, so he had improved quite early. Now, the question is, was it the hypothermia? Was it the early reduction? Uh, you know, or was it just a natural history of his particular trauma that he was getting better? But, but for, for better or worse, he was actually cooled intravascularly with a catheter for the next 48 hours. And on follow-up, most recently, he's actually quite a good Asia D. He still has some motor and sensory deficits that's in his hands and some difficulty with balance, but is actually ambulatory from a bilateral C3-4 facet fracture dislocation. So overall, quite a, good, uh, quite a good recovery. Now the question is, was this the hypothermia or not, or was it the other maneuvers that were performed? Well, that's hard to know, but it, it certainly provided quite a bit of hype around the whole use of hypothermia for spinal cord injury. Now, there are clinical trials in a lot of other fields, and uh, stroke, cardiac arrest, traumatic brain injury, aortic aneurysm repair, where people have used hypothermia uh, to some effect uh, to go ahead and promote neurological recovery. So the question is, what actually is the mechanism of action? And there's robust preclinical evidence to suggest that uh, uh, hypothermia works to reduce the metabolic demand and thereby help prevent secondary injury in spinal cord uh, trauma. It lowers the cellular metabolic demand and energy consumption. It can attenuate excitotoxicity, reduce inflammation, inhibit the breakdown of the blood-brain barrier and inhibit microglial activation, and reduce apoptosis. So all these th mechanisms are effective and, and promoted by hypothermia in the spinal cord injury models. Now, there are preclinical trials to suggest that it can be effective. There's two two main uh, mechanisms here, either local cooling with epidural catheters. Now this has varying effects, but there are our clinicals or our preclinical series where they've used systemic cooling to go ahead and improve outcomes. Now moderate cooling will improve uh, functional outcomes and will provide effective neuroprotection with both histological and biochemical improvements in spinal cord injury function after using hypothermia. Now, just a couple of definitions. So when you're reviewing this literature, if it comes out sort of in the next couple of years, you know what people are talking about. Uh, first of all, there's mild hypothermia. This is anywhere from 33 to 36 degrees uh, Celsius. Modest hypothermia, which is down to 28 degrees Celsius. And what most, mostly is used at, in the literature is modest hypothermia with a target temperature of 32, 33, 34 degrees Celsius. So that's what, what people are using from a clinical standpoint. And that's what's described mostly in the literature, both in the traumatic brain injury literature and the spinal cord injury literature. The severe complications that we worry about with hypothermia occur when temps are less than 30 degrees Celsius, and this can lead to severe arrhythmias and coagulopathies. So it's not that we use significant hypothermia, we use modest hypothermia when we're dealing with uh, hypothermia in these traumatic uh, spinal cord injury models. Now, a couple of other definitions, we can do local cooling, and that can be as simple as iced saline irrigation following a laminectomy, or as uh, the group in London uh, actually has done, place epidural catheters in the epidural space and go ahead and use iced saline there. The problem with that is a high infection rate, and even in a small series, a very, very significant infection rate, so this can be detrimental. Much of the historical literature is actually on local cooling, and basically over the years, particularly in the 70s and 80s, there were a number of papers uh, using laminectomy and, and local uh, iced cooling. And, and I've done it before, too, when I've lost signals, and, and anecdotally, it seems to do, do something for the spinal cord function. 
What is more common is systemic cooling. Uh, and this can be done by surface cooling where you use ice packs and cooling blankets, cool intravenous uh, saline. Uh, the problem with that is it's very slow to get down to the target temperature of 33 or 34 degrees. And then what's um, what's uh, more effective is endovascular cooling. And this is what our actual endo our, um, vascular surgeons use when they're doing this for uh, traumatic aneurysm, or not uh, traumatic aneurysm, atherosclerotic aneurysm repairs, where they place a catheter with a tip in the uh, IVC and actually cool using ice saline with, with a uh, machine. This is the machine that's used, and you can see you can insert an intra intravascular catheter into the femoral vein and go ahead and put it in the IVC. And what you're trying to do is go ahead and do a rapid reduction in body temperature, maintain it for anywhere from 36 to 48 hours, and then do a slow recooling, uh, or slow rewarming, I should say. Because if you rewarm too rapidly, that can actually increase, the, or be very detrimental to spinal cord function, and can actually cause further problems. So you have to do a slow rewarming when you go ahead and, and use this mechanism. So what's out there in the literature? Well, frankly, the biggest series is from the, uh, Miami, and th there's a couple of papers that need to be uh, sort of looked at very critically here. They're very effective at doing this, and they initially presented on 14 patients that they reported retrospectively, where they had 48 hours of modest hypothermia, again, a target around 33 degrees. They found no more complications than in their historical control group, and there were no adverse uh, events related to coagulopathy. In other words, no intramedullary or subdural or epidural hematomas that were uh, associated with this. The most common complications were pulmonary, but what they found was a 43% improvement of one AIS grade over their, and, and which was more than their historical controls, which had an improvement of about 26%. So they found a significant improvement or increase in improvement when they used this intravascular hypothermia. They followed that up with a prospective series and combined these two uh, groups together for a total of 35 patients. Now, four of these patients converted early, so they just looked at the 31 that didn't convert early, as our clinical example did initially, and found that actually over um, the course of their, of their um, follow-up of six to 12 months, they found that six patients improved one AIS grade, three patients improved two AIS grades, and two patients improved uh, three AIS grades for a 35.5% conversion rate. Now, again, when they looked at the historical control conversion rate, that was about 26%. So they felt that was a significant improvement in the conversion rate. And if you think about converting from an AIS-A to an AIS-C, that's a significant improvement, as are those patients who improved to an AIS-D. What about complications? Well, actually, they're actually looking at this now in a bigger prospective trial. And this just came out last year in the literature. And so essentially what they're looking at is a complication profile in the first 50 patients from a multicenter trial. And modest hypothermia was not associated with increased complications in the first six weeks, with the possible exception of this over here, where they noticed more pneumonias in those hypothermia patients than they did in the patients who were not provided with hypothermia. But all these other complications, if you look through them, actually they were slightly higher in the control group than they were in the hypothermia group. So the question is, how effective is it, and can, it be re can this effect be reproduced in a large multicenter trial? And I think we're going to have to await the results of this trial to see you know, whether, in fact, it's something we should be doing. This is a meta-analysis that was done, or actually a review, an updated review of the literature. And this is probably worthwhile, if you're interested at all, in looking at this, probably worthwhile reviewing. They looked at 24 preclinical studies and four clinical studies, and the preclinical studies showed a positive effect for both local and systemic cooling. And the four clinical studies had 35 patients with systemic cooling and 25 with local cooling. What they found is that both the systemic and the local groups improved and with significant conversion rates from AIS to A to B or better, with 43% in the systemic group and 58% in the local group. And in the cervical patients, they found a 35.5% conversion rate again compared to that 20% uh, conversion rate for historical controls. And most importantly, they noted no deterioration in the hypothermia patients.
So if it's effective, why aren't we using it more? Well, the problem is uh, for the neurosurgeons and, and Bajan and, and John will, will confirm with this and Tim, that um, it's not so effective in other injury models. And so if you look at the traumatic brain injury literature, it's actually been, uh, been pretty well panned in the traumatic brain injury literature. So you gotta look at this data with, with definitely a grain of salt. The, the trial that I present here is from the Polar Randomized Clinical Trial, which was a multi-center, multinational uh, head injury trial where they looked at 511 patients with severe traumatic brain injuries. They had a mean GCS of six. 266 were cooled with modest hypothermia, 244 with normal, hypothermia, uh, normal thermia treated. And they found their Glasgow outcome scale at six months in the good group, that is Glasgow outcome scale five to eight, they found no difference between hypothermia and normothermia in terms of their Glasgow outcome scale at six months. There were similar rates of complications, but overall there was no benefit to hypothermia in severe traumatic brain injury in multi multiple studies. So I think, you know, when you look at this, again, you have to look at it with a grain of salt and understand that even though there's robust preclinical data and some spinal cord injury data, it's hard to accomplish and there's certainly conflicting evidence from other injury models, particularly the traumatic brain injury literature. So that's a brief review of hypothermia and where we stand now. Uh, thanks for your attention. Appreciate it. I have one question. I don't think that one. Uh, that was really good, and I love the big picture perspective. Allow me a very simplistic uh, question. So I get the metabolic slowdown and the uh, theoretical concept, but Amanda and Bijan just talked about pumping more blood through the cord. And doesn't this just uh, this cooling down lead to vasospasm, vasospasm and contradict all and, and that? Exactly. Is are we doing other things that are more important? So should we give verapamil plus hypothermia? Or, yeah, exactly. Or Calcium channel blockers. Some people will do that. Not necessarily in these trials. I think realistically, I think it's the whole idea is trying to prevent the secondary injury. And and you got to remember the folks that are doing this are decompressing early. They're promoting mean arterial pressures greater than 90. They're doing everything they possibly can to get to optimize spinal cord function in these patients. So I think it's multifactorial as opposed to one thing working in, in, in you know, isolation. Great. That was really cool. Let's move ahead with the last.